Now there's another aspect of the problem, and that is that a great deal of our negative attitude to the experience of pain, and acute physical pain I'm speaking of now, is connected with a certain culturally conditioned unwillingness to react to pain in the natural way. In other words, we are afraid of giving in to suffering in the way that our own physical organism suggests to us. We are afraid of crying. We are afraid of screaming. We are afraid of going into those very undignified motions which constitute the human being's reaction in pain. Even though, as I just pointed out, we sometimes have the very same reactions in acute pleasure. But we are fundamentally ashamed of pain because we are taught that giving in to pain, weeping or something like that, is unmanly, sissy or something like that. Now it's a very dangerous doctrine that a human being should always be rigid in conditions of suffering. I often like to quote a passage from that Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, L-A-O-T-Z-U, which says, man at his birth is supple and tender. In death he is rigid and hard. Plants when they are young are pliant and soft, but when dead they are brittle and dry. Thus, tenderness and softness are the companions of life, but rigidity and hardness are the companions of death. In other words, there is strength in weakness. Consider a cat. When a cat drops off a tree, what does the cat do? Does it go rigid? Does it say, I'm going to be a real tough guy and meet the ground without flinching? Does the cat stick out its feet like this? No. Because if it did, when it hit the ground, it would be just a broken bag of bones. When the cat's in midair, it relaxes. It goes with it. It becomes weak. And so it hits the ground with a soft, heavy thud and is unharmed. Think also of water. Water was one of the basic symbols of Lao Tzu's philosophy, to be like water. Nothing in the world is softer and more yielding than water, and yet at the same time, nothing is like water for overcoming and wearing away things which are hard, like rocks. And thus, if you put a knife into water and you try to cut it, what happens? The water gives completely to the knife. The water closes up wherever the knife went. And although you strike at it as hard as you like, you can never create a wound. So it is, you see, because of its softness that the water triumphs over the hardness of the knife. So then it's the same with human beings. Unfortunately, we are so brought up to mistrust our natural feeling reactions to certain experiences. We are conditioned to believe that we will suffer less, that we will somehow triumph over pain if we hold our feelings rigid. But you know, our reactions to pain are in a way therapeutic. They're healing just like fever. When we have poisons in our blood, the natural defense mechanisms of the body send up our temperature and in this way boil out the invading bugs. Now it used to be thought that when people had fevers, this was the disease. The fever itself was the disease. And so once upon a time, doctors used to give medicine to take away the fever. But by taking away the fever, they very often kill the patient because they took away the defensive action of the body to drive out the disease. And so in just the same way, if one refuses to react in the way of nature to invasions of pain, so too one may shatter the body beyond what it can stand. It's the same thing, you know. No bridge will stand up unless it has give. If a steel suspension bridge is built so firmly that it doesn't sway in the wind, that bridge will come crashing down on the first gale. It's just because there's give in it that the bridge is strong. Take a great building like the Empire State. The Empire State also has a sway in it. 
And if it didn't have that sway, it would be a very insecure structure indeed. So then, when we are willing to react to pain as our own natural feeling suggests, if we are willing to scream, if we are willing to weep, if we are willing to wriggle and writhe as pain suggests to us to do, a very strange thing happens. The very willingness to react in that way often makes it quite unnecessary to do so. Now you may say I'm just talking big and the only way I can prove what I say is the next time you have a toothache, the next time you have any serious pain, see what happens if you do this. If you, as it were, go along with the pain and don't try to fight it, yield, become weak and you will discover the strength of weakness. So then you see, this is not really an escapist philosophy at all. It is most definitely a philosophy of keeping in mind the actual reality of the situation in which you find yourself. I don't know what could be more realistic than this, what could be more fundamentally facing the hard facts of life. One keeps his attention on the actual concrete fact that is happening as distinct from our socially conditioned and inculcated ideas and attitudes about it. And this is really facing reality a hundred percent. And so, there come out of this two basic results. The first is that when we don't resist pain, we don't set up a vicious circle in connection with it. Take the pain of fear again. Supposing you're in a situation where the doctor has told you you have to have an operation. And of course, if you're going to undergo this operation uh, in the best way, you need to be rested, you need to have plenty of sleep, you need to be strong, and so on. Well, fine advice, isn't it? Because the moment you know you've got to have an operation, you're liable to get a bit frightened, and then you know you ought not to be frightened. You ought not to stay awake at nights and worry about it. You need sleep. And then you get afraid, you see, because you're afraid. You're afraid that your fear is going to lead to insomnia and uh, debility, and so you are afraid of being afraid. And then because you see that you are afraid of being afraid, you are afraid because you are afraid because you are afraid. So that worry is always a vicious circle in which you are worrying because you worry because you worry because you worry. And this, as it were, builds up a whole chain of reactions which makes the pain of fear worse and worse and worse. So then, if at any point in this link we can, as it were, be willing, be willing to be worried, and then you don't worry about being worried. Be willing to be afraid, then you don't have to be afraid of being afraid. And so this, in other words, diminishes the total amount of pain because it doesn't allow the painful situation to build itself up and up and up and up. In the same way, if somebody stuck a hook into you and you pull away from it, well, the hook goes more deeply into you. But if you're caught like a fish on a hook and you go with the hook, this reduces the amount of tension. And this works backwards all the way down the line. Now, there's also a second result. And that is that when our mind our consciousness, our attention, is fully focused on what is, on the actual situation. As I said, we are free from various thoughts about it and associations with it that bring up a context which makes the experience painful. So you might say that this is an attitude of taking things as they come one at a time. For example, many of you who are not blessed with dishwashers have to wash many dishes day after day. And when you've been married as a woman for, oh, 10 or 11 years, one day you're sitting there at the sink, utterly weary of the whole thing. And in your mind's eye comes the immense pile of dishes which you've had to wash day after day in the past. 
There they are in your mind's eye, standing up, piled forever and ever on the draining board. And also in your mind's eye is that enormous pile of dishes that you're going to have to wash in the future. And you think, my life is that of a mere drudge. Washing dishes, washing dishes, washing dishes, and there's no end to it. But if you were realistic, you would see this. You have only one dish to wash in your life, this one. You can only wash one dish at a time, and that's the only one you have to deal with. It's the same with climbing a mountain. If you start to think as you climb, oh, what a lot of steps to take, then the task becomes utterly oppressive. Or if, for example, you make a New Year's resolution and you say, well, I'm going to go on the wagon. I'm not going to drink anymore this New Year. And if you say, this whole year I will not touch another drop of drink, well, of course, the old devil immediately brings to your mind 365 days of not drinking anything, anything alcoholic. And that's overwhelming. Don't tempt the devil that way. One conquers the problem by not drinking this one and saying nothing about the next. So with the climbing of the mountain, taking each step as if it were the only step to be taken. And so, in the situation then, where there is the experience of agony, whether it be physical or whether it be moral, the way out is, in a way, suffering that agony as if this were the only thing in the whole world to be done. By going right down to the bottom of the furnace, no further pains will harass you. It was also so, isn't it, in Dante's Divine Comedy, when Dante and Virgil find their way out of hell by going down to the very center of hell. I like to illustrate this with another of those Zen stories. There was a monk who got news that his mother had died and he was weeping. And another Buddhist monk said to him, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You, a monk, still showing worldly attachments by weeping. He said, don't be silly. I'm weeping because I want to weep. Nothing is more terrifying than the state of chronic anxiety which one has if you are subject to the illusion that something or other in life could be held onto and safeguarded. And nothing can. So the acceptance of uh, everything flowing away is absolutely basic to freedom, to being uh, an unsui, a cloud water person who drifts like cloud and flows like water. But in this, we mustn't take ourselves too ridiculously. I mean, Naturally, all human beings have in them a certain clinging. See, you can't let go totally. You wouldn't be human if you did. You can't be just a leaf on the wind, or just a ball in a mountain stream, to use a Zen poetic phrase. Because if you were that, you wouldn't be human. Just as I pointed out that a person with no emotions, who has completely controlled his emotions, is a stone Buddha, so a person who would be completely let go would also be some kind of an inanimate object. So Zen very definitely emphasizes uh, being human, being perfectly human as its ideal. And so to be perfectly human, one must have not a state of absolute detachment, but a state of detachment which contains a little bit of resistance. A certain clinging still. They say in India of uh, Jivan Mukta, a man who is liberated in this world, that he has to cultivate a few mild bad habits in order to stay in the body. Because if he were absolutely perfect, he would disappear from manifestation. And so uh, the... the uh, the yogi, great yogi, maybe he smokes a cigarette or has a bad temper occasionally. It's something that keeps him human. And that thing, little thing is very important. See, it's like the salt in a stew. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, it grounds him. Well, this is another way of saying that uh, even a very great sage, a great Buddha, 
will have in him a touch of regret that life is fleeting because if he doesn't have that touch of regret he's not human and he is incapable of compassion towards people who regret very much that life is fleeting.